by the end of this playlist, you will be able to write and compile your own GPU accelerated application for NVIDIA CUDA in Python. Acceleration is an advanced topic. So if you are not confident about your Python, I suggest you to check our Python beginners tutorial series. I am Ronak Paul and throughout this series, I'll be your lecturer. Instead of diving into coding from the get go, especially if you don't have much experience with acceleration, let's start with a simplified metaphor to help you understand what exactly is acceleration. Let's assume you are a tour guide and you are tasked with giving a tour of the city. This city has its own set of attraction which you must cover while maintaining all the city rules. This is your application space. You have a car which you drive around the city in a predetermined path with the passengers to give them the tour. This path can be your algorithm and the car is your processor. Every year you get more and more tour requests. So you keep upgrading to a newer faster car. But you have already bought a racing car and although it is very fast, it can only hold up to three other passengers. So what can you do to deal with this very high demand? Luckily, our tour guide is a computer science student and he has learned about acceleration. So he decides to get a bus. Now what happened? Bus is slower than car, right? But bus can give 2 to 30 persons at the same time. So even though the bus is slower, his one tour with the bus will cover 10 times giving tour with the car. His path may have slightly changed as not all roads allow the bus. Hence, he has slightly different algorithm now. And instead of using the car, he moved on to a different mode of transportation, which is the bus. So his processing device also changed. So his overall task of giving the tour has accelerated, although the bus is essentially slower than the car. Now, there are clear advantages and disadvantages to this approach. The bus takes more fuel to run. And onboarding 30 people takes much more time than just asking 3 people to sit on your car. These things can be thought of as a small tax to pay for using the bus. In computer science terms, this is called acceleration tax. As your passengers or data grows, you can create your own fleet of buses. This is exactly what happens in case of GPU acceleration. So even the bus will be useless to you unless you learn to drive it, right? So let's abandon the metaphor and dive into learning acceleration with CUDA. So what exactly can we accelerate in our algorithm? Three things to keep an eye for to implement acceleration on. So the first is processing large blocks of data in a deterministic way which also means the variables or the data are not related to each other. Next, have well-defined data dependencies, preferably sequential or stream-based processing. Always try to avoid random access. And the final point is processing time on the CPU is at least larger than the acceleration tax. Now, two terminologies we will be following from now on, which are the CPU with its RAM and storage will be called the host, while the GPU or the graphics card with its thousands of CUDA cores will be referred to as the device. And that's it for this video. Next time we will be installing CUDA toolkit from NVIDIA and set up Python environment. We will also see how to run acceleration on Google Colop for those who are missing NVIDIA GPU in their system. So it's time to install CUDA toolkit and start coding. If you have not already, make sure to check out the introduction video. It has the acceleration basics concepts. Also, make sure to put some comments in the comment section below to make the YouTube algorithm happy and for better reach. With that out of the way, open your browser and search for CUDA toolkit. So you will come across this NVIDIA website. And over here, go to download now and choose your platform. I'll go to Windows 11 and I'm downloading the local version. So it's 3.1 gigabytes. I already actually have this. So let's open this. So just run the exe file and complete the setup. 
Also before this make sure you have latest Nvidia drivers installed. So it will first check your system and if everything goes fine it will ask you to go through this agreement and yeah I can actually read that fast. So let's agree and continue. No need to go to custom just go express installation and next. Well, I already had CUDA installed, so it is saying removing previous version. But for your case, it should start directly installing it. So it's no issue. Now, once that's done, hit next. And that's it. The CUDA toolkit has been installed. So you can close the browser and you can open up a terminal we need to install some stuff so in my terminal first i have python already installed so this is my current python version and i have the corresponding pip also so once you have python and pip you need something called qpy so just search for QPy and you will be introduced to the QPy installation. From here, since we downloaded CUDA version 12, we can run this command. So I will copy this and head over to my terminal. I already have it installed actually. In your case, it will take some time and install it. So now we have QPy. So in this video, we will learn about QPy. And in the next video, we will learn number. So QPy is a NumPy like implementation of arrays, but QPy exclusively works on the device. So once you have QPy installed, go to your development environment. And over here, I am using VS Code, but you can use Jupyter or anything else. So if you are missing NVIDIA GPU on your system, you can also use the Google Colab. So over here, if I do import QPy as CP and run this, we will face an error. So we don't have actually GPU enabled. So go to this drop down and change runtime type. Over there, select T4 GPU and save it. Once you have saved it, it will take some time to create an instance for you with the GPU. And now we have it. So let's try to run this. And as you can see, QPy has been imported properly. So whenever you are importing a GPU, the Google Colab will do everything for you, all the installation and everything. So excuse my setup, but my task manager will be sharing some part of the screen. So let's move on to Python and import the necessary libraries. So first I'll import numpy and then I'll import qpy as cp. So numpy, I'm expecting that you all know about numpy by this point. Numpy is the array implementation which is done on CPU or the host. And qpy is the same thing. So this is a copy of numpy but all the processing of qpy is done on the device or the GPU. So let's see how we can create an array on the host. So it's pretty straightforward. So in host, I'm creating np.array, then I'm passing in a list. So this list will be converted to a numpy array and our x host will be a numpy array that is being created on the host or the system RAM. But now if I do the same thing, but with qpy library, so qpy.array, then I'll pass in a list so this will be converted to a qpy array. So this x device will actually be an array that is created in the GPU. So I'll just uh, put a print message for type of these two variables. And let's run this. As you can see that the x host is numpy.nd array. Similarly, the x device is qpy.nd array. So your device or the GPU is connected via PCI to your host or to your computer. When I give command like this in Python, 
this actually gets executed in the CPU. So from the CPU, this instruction of creating an array to the GPU has to be carried over via the PCI Express. And also this data needs to be carried over there to create the array with this data. So whenever I'm calling this, this is my acceleration tax. If you are not familiar with that, check out the introduction video. I have explained acceleration tax over there. So this steps takes time. And whenever I'm creating or reserving this memory, two things actually happening via the PCI Express. First, this instruction is getting carried over to create an array. And the second thing, the data itself is being passed to create the array with. So after both of these are done, we have a qpy.nd array which lies on the device. So let's see why this is exactly a costly operation. I'll try to find the Euclidean norm. So first, let's do it on the CPU. So I'll have numpy dot linear algebra dot norm. So I have used the keyword time it. It ran it multiple times and you can see 2.32 microsecond has been taken to execute this. Now if I do the same thing, but on the device, so I'll do CP dot linear algebra dot norm and the device memory. So when I'm giving the command for the device, I also have to use the data that is stored in the device. So if I run this, you can see that the time taken is much more longer. It looks like the GPU is 50 times slower than the CPU. So what actually happened? We wanted to accelerate, right? But here we can see that the GPU actually took longer time. So why exactly this happened? So this happened because of the acceleration tax. So data transfer is not actually main concern over here as we have already transferred the data via this cp.array line. So our data is already stored in the device. So now when doing the computation, if you remember the metaphor of the bus and the car, the car was a racing car. So the car was much, much faster. So our CPU runs at around five gigahertz. But in comparison to that, the GPU runs at around 1.5 gigahertz. So by default, the GPU runs much, much slower than the CPU. So when the task is small enough, the CPU will always outperform the GPU. That exactly happened over here. So it was kind of disappointing, right? Like we went through this process of installing CUDA, installing QPy and setting everything up, but we ended up with a slower processing time overall. But not to worry, we'll soon see how acceleration comes into play. Before that, if you have multiple GPU in your system, you can actually select which GPU to use whenever creating a QPy array. So, So if you have three devices, it will be indexed from zero to two. So zero and zero, one and two using cp.cuda.device and then passing in the index for your GPU, you can actually select which GPU to create the QPy array on. So I actually have only one GPU in my system. So if I run this, it will run fine. But if I change this index, it will throw me an error. So let's move on to acceleration and not this acceleration why do we actually saw that we did not make any acceleration so our device runtime actually took longer so let's do our first proper acceleration so over here i am creating a numpy array on the host with the shape 20,000 cross 20,000 and all the values in this array will be integers ranging from 0 to 255. So whenever I create this, you can see in the right hand side in my task manager that the RAM usage has increased. So let's create this array. And as you can see, this array has been created in my memory and the usage has increased. So I have this in the host memory. Now, 
I also need this on the GPU. So I'll transfer it from my host to the GPU. Using cp dot as array method. So cp dot as array will take any numpy array or any list and then send it to the device. So it will also create an array in the device with the same data. So if I go to my GPU and you can see that the dedicated GPU memory usage is currently flat. So as soon as I run this, we can see that this much memory has been used to create this x underscore device variable. Now this array is the same array which I have in the host. So I actually created this array in the host and I transferred it to the device. So both versions have same data. Now you can do the opposite. If you have any array in the GPU, you can take it back in the host. So I'll just put some other name so that we can see that the memory usage has been changed. So on the x underscore device array, which is on the GPU, I'll do dot get. So if I run this, it will return a numpy array and x underscore host underscore one is on the CPU right now. So the RAM usage has spiked again. Now this is how you can keep transferring data between the host and the device through the PCI LAN. Now we will use the fast Fourier transformation algorithm to see the result of our acceleration. Uh, before that, let me just reduce the size of this array because my device don't have much memory to handle it. So I'll just do 2000 cross 2000 and I'll run all of this. So I have the same data in the device and the host. So to compute the fast Fourier transformation on the host, I will be using scipy.fft. So scipy is a scientific Python library with many such functions which are very demanding when doing computation. So we have the same data in the host and the device. Let's use the host data to perform this FFT on the host itself. So I'll time it. And as you can see that when the FFT was running, my CPU usage has a spike. And this process took 67.2 millisecond on average. So to get the implementation of fast Fourier transformation on the GPU, we have to use QPyX. So QPyX comes with QPy, which mimics all the scientific functions from SciPy and NumPy for the GPU. So once I have QPyX imported, I can do qpyx.scifi.fft.ftn. So if you remember, before we did scifi.fft, from that we imported fftn. So similarly, we are also doing scifi.fft from there, we are accessing fftn. But this time, this is a qpyx implementation. So this is a GPU implementation. Also, we cannot give a host data to the device. Because for the device, that data does not even exist. So using the device data, I will execute this and time it. Also, keep an eye on the CPU usage. So I am hovering around 35% utilization. So as soon as I run this, I am using the GPU 95%. So yeah, like uh, yeah, we are pushing the limits at this point. <laughs> My poor system cannot handle so much. But let's see what is the time. So once time it has run all of its iterations, we can see that on an average 16.1 milliseconds was taken. Like, wow, like really wow. Let me bring my calculator. So I'll do 67.2 divided by 16.1 and then I'll multiply this with 100. So we achieved 417% acceleration. Okay, that's something else. So how exactly we got this acceleration? In the first execution of the FFT, it was done on the CPU, where the matrix has been given, which was 2000 cross 2000. Now, so for all of these data, one by one execution has been done. But when you are doing the same thing on the GPU, we have thousands of CUDA cores. And this QPy.x library has 
code written to efficiently multi-thread this algorithm. So, so in theory, we created one thread for one execution of the FFTA. And like that, we had n many threads. And once the device data was loaded to the GPU and the instruction to run FFT was given, at that time all these threads ran parallelly. And even though the GPU has less clock speed than the CPU, it actually could beat the CPU through parallel processing. And that's how we can do acceleration. Now, QPy is actually a very limited library. So if you want to accelerate any algorithm of our own, this library is not going to get us very far. In the next video, we will learn Numba, where we can write Python code and use just-in-time compiler to compile CUDA kernels for the device. And that's it for this video. Also, let me know in the comment section how easy or difficult this video was for you. So, we have already seen data transfer between the host and the device using QPy. And we have already run the CUDA kernels found inside QPy. So this time we will be writing our own CUDA kernel and execute it on the device. So on that note, make sure you have Numba installed. So you can do pip install Numba. And I already have it installed. In your case, it will take some time and install it. So once you have Numba installed, you can do from Numba import CUDA. With that, we will also get NumPy and math module. So import numpy as np and import math. So let's create an array in our host. So I'll call this x underscore host which will be np dot ones. So this is a array filled up with ones and shape will be one dimensional array 65536. Now today our goal is to write and execute a simple kernel on the device. And this kernel will increment every value of this array by 1. So let's write a host code which will be run by the python interpreter. So in this function I will take an array as an input and for i in range length of array. So I am not doing enumerate because in often cases zip data type is not supported in CUDA. That's why I have range then length. So from there, I will access the ith element of that array and I will increment it by one. And let's see the runtime for this function. So I'll do time it and host increment by one. Then I'll pass in x host. So let's execute all of this. So as you can see, on an average 10.9 millisecond has been taken. Now we want to do the same functionality but on the device. But there is a catch. The architecture of the device or the GPU is vastly different from that of the CPU. So in case of a CPU, the Python will be running on single thread. And the array we have created from that data will be one by one fed to the thread and will get executed. This CPU thread is very fast, running at around 3 to 5 gigahertz. But for a device, the scenario is completely different. So every GPU contains thousands if not millions of CUDA cores. And these CUDA cores are arranged in a grid format. In every CUDA core, a single thread will be running. And multiple of these threads will be grouped together, which will be called block. And multiple of these blocks will be grouped together once again to create our application space which will be called grid. So once we have this architecture, whatever kernel we write, a copy of that kernel will be passed into all of the threads individually. Now all of this thread has the access to the GPU memory. So it can directly get the memory and corresponding to whichever cell it is, it will get one or multiple data whichever way the kernel defines it. So once this data has been passed into every thread, all the threads will execute it at once and the data will be processed. So let's see how we have to modify our increment by one function to work on this device. So here is a program and it has the same functionality as the increment by one host function. But if you have noticed over here, we cannot find any for loop 
to go through the array. Instead, we have this tx which is thread id, ty which is block id and then block dimension we also have. So as I said previously, this kernel logic will be copied over to every CUDA kernel separately. So if we have an array of n length, we can have n many CUDA kernels and we can pass one element of the array to each CUDA core. That is how a sequential loop has been parallelized using CUDA. So over here, at first we are using a decorator called CUDA.JIT. So JIT stands for just-in-time compiler. Like Python is an interpreted language. By this point you all should know this. But using JIT, we can actually compile Python code. And it will behave exactly same as program compiled by C, C++ or any other compiled language. So using JIT, we will compile this function only and send this as a kernel to the device. And once all the CUDA thread have this instruction set, we just need to give them the appropriate data. So inside the thread, we have to get the position of the thread itself. So every thread can be thought of its own application space. And in this application space, the thread is aware of its position in the grid. So we can calculate the position using CUDA.thread ID, CUDA.block ID and CUDA.block dimension. After calculating it, we have to get the corresponding data from the array and then we can modify the data itself. So let's actually write this and try to understand it. So first I'll use the decorator with just on time compiler. If you don't know what decorator is, I have a video in the Python beginner series. Go check it out. Let's define the function like a normal Python function. So after def, we have the name of the function and the array we want to pass it to it. Now comes the tricky part. We have to think it like from the point of view of the device. So this code, we have to write a sequential code, which will then be passed to the all the CUDA cores to be parallelized. So let's get the thread ID first. And next we'll get the block ID also. So once we have both of these, we need the block width. So which means number of threads per block. Now we have everything to calculate the position of the thread which will be dealing with a particular value of the array. So this equation will return the exact position of the thread. So if my grid is bigger than the array, we don't want to keep on calculating in the all course. So for that, I have a boundary condition. And inside it, I can perform my sequential logic. And when this gets parallelized, this position will be different for each thread. And accordingly, all the values from this array will get incremented. So before we can call this function, we need some additional information to create this grid itself. So again, I have created a numpy array of ones on the host. And using CUDA.2 device method, I am transferring this data to the device memory. So this line works exactly as qpy.asarray which also sends data from host to the device. After that, I have to define threads per block. Over here, I have written 256. You can go with any number and I have to calculate blocks per grid. So once we have threads per block and blocks per grid, we can finally call this function. So to call this jitted function on the GPU, we have to use the name of the function and after that, inside square brackets, we have to first pass the blocks per grid and then the threads per block. So this is very important. This will actually create the grid itself. So without creating a grid, we cannot call a kernel function. So once the function and the grid both are ready, we can actually pass in the data itself. So make sure you are not passing a host data over here. Because for this kernel, this does not even know that host data exists. It only has access to the device data. So let's run this. CPU time took 15.6. This is the compilation time actually. And wall time took 127 ms. So actually what happened? This is not what we expected, right? This was actually very, very slower than the CPU execution. But if you run this again, you can see that this has significantly sped up. So if I do time it and run it, 
it only took 33 microsecond instead of 10 millisecond which is like something around 1000 times faster. So what happened first time? As I said, in the first call of this function, we had to compile this function in binary and transfer it via PCI to the device. And also we had to create this grid itself. That's why it took so much time. But once this has been called, everything has been cached on the device itself. So once that is done, we can simply execute this and we can see the acceleration and it is by margin a lot faster than before. Now all of this calculation is actually a part of the CUDA module. So instead of manually calculating the position from thread ID and block ID, we can directly do position equals to CUDA dot grid. So inside that we have to give the dimension of the grid and that's it. And let's run it again. It is working as expected. Also you can see the device data. So for that I will do X device dot copy to host and I'll execute this. So wait, uh, what happened? We can see 81112, right? This is very interesting because as I said, the CUDA kernel does not return anything. So we are in position actually modifying the values and what time it does, time it actually runs it for multiple times. So as many times it was run, the data that was in the device actually got incremented every time by one. So if we want to avoid this, we actually have to recreate these ones and then I will just remove it, the time it line and I'll run this. And now if we see the array, everything is two, 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 because we started with np dot ones. So every value of this array has increased by one. So let's recap and see what are the things we did just now. So first, for the CPU, we did a for loop. So inside that for loop, all the data of that array, we went to every data one by one and incremented every data by plus one. And this for loop was running on a single thread. So first the zeroth element was incremented to two, then the first element was incremented to 2 and so on and the nth element was incremented to 2. But in case of the device, we first transferred the data to the device itself. So all the array elements we have in the device. Now we have written a sequential code. So in this code, it is executed line by line and this is missing a for loop. Now after that, we have created a grid with the desired size to increment everything from this array. So the sequential logic we wrote, it will first get the thread ID. And after that, it will get the corresponding data that it has to work on using that ID. So from thread ID, we'll get position. And from position, we'll get the element of the array. So once we have this element, we can actually execute this thread. So all of this thread did the same thing simultaneously and this increment by one operation was done together in a parallel way. That's how we achieved acceleration. Now this was a simple enough example for one dimensional data. Let's work with two dimensional data on this same logic. So I will create some data on the device. And over here, I will pass shape as a 2D matrix. Now it's time to write the kernel itself. So I will use the JIT decorator. So at the end, CUDA.JIT. Then name of the function. Once I have everything, the data on this device has the dimension of two. So what we can do, we can get the thread position in two dimensional form. So I can do x comma y equals to CUDA dot grid. Then I have to pass two over here. Now I'll just do the boundary condition.
and I'll just update the value of that array for this position. And that's it. So let's calculate blocks per grid and threads per block. So we can write our own custom threads per block, which I am writing over here 16 comma 16. And from there we'll get blocks per grid for the X and Y dimensions. So blocks per grid, then we'll do ceiling. So shape zero divided by threads per block zero, which is 16 over here. And similarly blocks per grid for Y dimension, we can do the same thing, but with shape one. And lastly, we can define blocks by grid as this tuple. Now it's time to call this function. So I'll time it and call the 2D increment function and I'll pass blocks per grid and threads per block. With that, I'll also pass the device data that we have created previously. So let's execute everything. And as you can see, this was also fairly fast. If you see 32.1 microsecond, which is exactly as the 32.7 microsecond because we have enough CUDA cores to handle this 2D operations also. So every data of this two dimensional array also was passed to single thread and everything was calculated at once. So this is how you can work with 2D arrays using the JIT decorator. So this is not limited to the shape of the array or anything else. You can have a two dimensional array while your thread per block can be a one dimension and for every kernel you are working on one nested array itself. So previously we used QPy to handle arrays. We can actually use QPy arrays with this number decorator because QPy implementation of array is also based on the CUDA toolkit provided by NVIDIA. So number can convert the QPy array to the number array. So let's import QPy. And I'll create the QPy array and pass it to the kernel which we have created using number. So if you run this, everything worked fine. And let's see the device and the array type. So although this kernel worked on this QPy array, it did not change the type of this array. So our array is still QPy.nd array. And yeah. And the result is as expected. So everywhere we have two. Now this example was very simple, but it may feel very different from how you are used to writing program in Python. So to write a CUDA kernel, we have to think from the perspective of the GPU itself. Loops are something we don't need inside the GPU because it has so many parallel cores. Every core can handle a singular data at a time. So we have to modify our programs to work like that. And so once we have done that, we can access the data inside the GPU and every kernel can do their job simultaneously. So next time we will try to write a bit more complicated kernels for CUDA. So as a practice challenge, I want you guys to implement square matrix multiplication on CUDA. And in the comment section, you can write your GTET function. So looking forward to your answers. See you next time. So this time we will learn about how exactly memory works inside the GPU or the device. So previously we have already seen how to write a simple CUDA kernel and run it on the GPU. Now let's warm up with the vector addition example. So before I can start anything, I have to import the NumPy and the CUDA module from number. I'll also get the float data type, which we'll be using in the later part of this video. And I'll also get the math module. Now vector additions on CPU are done with a for loop where we loop over every index of the both vectors and add them. But in the GPU, we can parallelize it and compute one sum at each thread. So let's write the program from the point of view of the device or the GPU. So first I will use the CUDA.jet decorator and after that I will define the function. So I'll just call it F. Now we will be using one dimensional arrays and over here for CUDA.grid I have passed one dimension and that's how we'll get position inside every thread. Now I'll save the size of the output buffer 
and after checking if position is less than size i can index the output buffer and add corresponding values from the both inputs and that's actually it so let's try to run it and before that we have to create the grid itself so n i am taking as the length of the vectors so over here i have created a random array and send it to the device and similarly i'll create another random array and send it to the device also and see over here i'm creating a device array like a so what this function does is it will create an array on the gpu directly with the shape of a so it will be a null array but with the shape of a so once we have this we can use f dot for all so what for all does it creates one dimensional grid for the given size so size i'm giving over here length of a it does not matter because size of a b and c all are same and after that i'm passing our argument so for all we'll actually calculate and define the grid for us after that we'll copy the output from the device to the host so why this step is necessary because cuda kernels cannot return anything that's why we have to pass the c which is output buffer as a parameter to the function and we are changing the value of c in position so if i run everything we can see the sum has been returned to the host now instead of using for all we can actually manually define our grid like we did in the previous video so over here i have manually defined the grid so for the grid i have defined the blocks and threads once this calculation is done i'll get the output from the device and let's see yeah the result is exactly same even with our custom grid so moving on to matrix multiplication i actually gave this as a task in the last video so let's solve this first we'll go over how exactly matrix multiplication works so we are working with square matrices and a and b are our input matrices and c is the output buffer so to multiply two matrices we have to get the row from the first matrix and the column from the second matrix and perform dot product on them and the resulting value will go to the intersecting index of the output matrix so previously i have also mentioned that the gpu or the device has its own memory so whenever we create some array or transfer it to the device we are actually using this memory pool and all the threads which are in our grid have access to this memory so to perform a matrix multiplication in a cpu we have to loop over for every entry in the output buffer so over here there is a four cost per matrix we have 16 outputs over here when doing matrix multiplication on the host we have to run a for loop for 16 times to calculate each value but in the device we can create a grid which resembles the matrix itself and each thread can take care of the output of each cell like that the output will be computed for all of c at once so let's implement this in python i will start with cuda.jit decorator after that i will define the name of the function and all the input parameters so the input matrices are two dimensional that's why I'm getting the thread ID as a I comma J pair. Now I'll put a condition so that no unnecessary computations happen. And after that, I'll write a simple logic for multiplication and accumulation. So which is dot product over here to perform the accumulation. I'm defining a temporary variable and I'm assigning it to zero after that let's write the loop so this is how you will do multiplication and accumulation for the dot product and once this dot product has been calculated for the i comma j thread in the grid we can simply push that result to the output buffer i comma j and that's it for the matrix multiplication so let's run this now i'll create xh which has 16 elements and i'll reshape it to 4 comma 4 so we have a 4 cross 4 square matrix now vy will be a 4 cross 4 matrix with ones 
Now z underscore h will be the output buffer filled with zeros. Now we have created all of these things on the host. Let's move them to the device. So x underscore d will have the data from x underscore h but inside the device. Similarly, we can create x underscore d and z underscore d. Now we have all the input and output buffers ready. So let's build the grid. Over here, this is how I am defining heads per block and blocks per grid. So this is similar to how we did for the 2D sum. Now to call the matmal kernel, I have to pass in this blocks per grid and heads per block to create the grid. And after that I have to pass our input buffers and the output buffer. And lastly, I'll get this data back to the host. So let's run this. Oh, I actually forgot to print. So let's print this also. So as you can see, the matrix multiplication has been done. So this matrix multiplication is not optimal at all. So what do I mean by that? Let's go back to the slides and see what is actually happening over here. So when calculating inside one thread, we are getting the row and the column. And we are doing this inside a for loop, right? Inside the for loop, we are looping over all the data of the first row and all the data of the first column from A and B respectively. So first we are accessing 1 comma 1 from both A and B. After that we are accessing 1 comma 2 and 2 comma 1 from A and B. Next we are moving on to the next data and like that we are looping over the first row of A and first column of B. But if you have noticed every time in the for loop we are talking to the GPU memory pool and we are trying to pull a data from the GPU memory pool. So in the previous videos, we have already seen that data transfer is a costly operation. Between host to device, this takes a lot of time. But this memory is already on the device. So from device to the thread itself, also this takes time. That's why our current matrix multiplication is not optimal at all. Because every time we are in the loop, we are accessing data directly from the memory pool. And even though this memory pool is on the device itself, talking to this memory is slower. So what can we do to improve this? Let's see. So there is a portion of memory in the grid itself, which is very fast. And this is locally available to the threads. This memory is called shared memory. And this is shared between all the threads in a block. So this shared memory will look something like this. And now we can actually preload the data from A and B and use this shared memory during the for loop which will be much more faster than directly talking to the GPU memory pool. So let's try to implement this shared memory thing. For that I'll first define thread per block. Let's write our CUDA kernel. So after the CUDA.jit decorator I'll give the name first matmal. And I have given it both of the input buffers and the output buffer. So let's define the array in the shared memory. So over here we have defined the shared memory to have this threads per block comma threads per block shape. And the data type we are providing it as float32. Now if you have noticed we are actually declaring this shared memory inside this kernel. And from the previous video if you recall a copy of this kernel will be passed on to each thread and they will run separately. So in theory a multiple of this should get created for each thread right. But that's why the shared memory is different. So inside all of the threads whenever this shared memory is declared it will also share the location and the indices. So even though this will be run multiple times in every thread multiple reference of this will be created but not instances. So there will only be one shared memory and we are referencing that shared memory inside every thread. So this is my SA and SB. Now to get the absolute position of the thread in the grid we can do this CUDA.grid then I will pass the dimension we want. So 2 over here. And I'll also get the thread IDs and blocks per grid. 
Now previously also we did each thread computes one element in the result matrix. So temp over here I am defining as float32 of 0 and now now inside this for loop I will preload the data. So this for loop will iterate over the required data to calculate one value of the output matrix and preload that much data only. So once we have this preload operation done, we can move on to the next step. So before starting the multiplication and accumulation for the dot product, we have to actually wait for all the threads to sync. Why this is needed, I'll explain in a moment. So this is where our multiplication and accumulation is happening. But unlike previously, we are accessing the shared memory instead of the device global memory. So this operation will be much more faster this time. So after that we can do CUDA.sync threads again and I will come back to that in a moment. And finally we can assign our dot product to the respective output buffer index. And that's it our modified version of the matrix multiplication using shared memory. It's time to run this. So over here I have created the same data buffers as before and over here I have also calculated threads per block and blocks per grid to create our grid and we have everything to call this function now so let's do that. So I am calling this matmul and in the end I will get the result from the device to the host. And I'll check for if the output is equal to a normal matrix multiplication done on the CPU or the host. So this add the rate symbol is a built-in Python function to multiply to matrices. So let's run everything. And as you can see true has been printed. So our multiplication logic is correct. Now coming back to why this CUDA.sync thread is required. Let's remove this and let's run our program. So as you can see false has been printed. So what happened? Suddenly our matrix multiplication is logic cannot be wrong, right? We just saw that it was correct. So if I go back to the slide, what happens is the execution time of all of these threads are not same. Let's say thread one has preloaded the data and modified the shared memory. But as I said, this memory is shared between the different threads and our thread two is very slow and it has yet to preload the data. So the data in the shared memory has already changed by the time the thread 2 is trying to modify the shared memory. So like that one thread's performance can affect other things also. So this shared memory needs to be preloaded for all of the threads and then we can proceed to perform our matrix multiplication. That's why syncing after the preload and syncing after the operation of the matrix itself is required. Otherwise, the result of the matrix multiplication will be wrong. Uh, so that's it for today. And next time we will see some other very useful functionalities that are also inside the number library. So this will be a bonus episode for number. And this will also be the last episode of this tutorial series. I may continue this series in the future if enough people are interested in this. So let me know in the comment section. So let's start by importing numpy and importing jit and vectorize from number. So if you have noticed that we have not imported CUDA, we directly imported jit. So in this video, whatever we will be compiling will actually be run on the CPU. But Python is an interpreted language. So using number and just in time compiler of number, we can actually compile program for the CPU also. So creating a jitted function for the CPU will not require the NVIDIA graphics or the CUDA library. So let's create a data. So over here I have created uh, an array of random integers. Now I will be using at the rate jit. So we are not actually using CUDA.jit, we are just using jit. So this will be compiled for the processor or the CPU. 
so this is our functions now this function will take in an array and return another array but depending on the input array if we encounter any even numbers the zero the value zero will be appended in the output array if we encounter any odd numbers the value one will be appended in the output array so this is our entire jtet function and we want to compile it so let's do that let's run this so i'll do time it and inside my jtet function i'll pass in this x so if i run this you can see that time has been taken 29.1 milliseconds and also there are some long texts over here so let's see what this text says so it says compilation is falling back to object mode so what is object mode the jit or the just in time compiler for numba has two modes one is object mode another one is no python mode so if you have noticed that we have created an empty array and while we are inserting the values integer 0 and string 1 so this kind of mixed data type is fine in python but this mixed data type cannot be processed entirely without python so whenever this function is called this function has to heavily rely on the python interpreter to handle this mixed kind of data inside this output array that's why this object mode has been inferred which means the python interpreter will be invoked during the execution of this function so if we want to mention that we don't want the python interpreter explicitly we can do no python equals to true so right now whatever happens this jtet function will not rely on the python interpreter so let's run this and as expected we got an error because this makes kind of data type without the python interpreter is not possible to be processed so let's change this to integer one and now if we run this as you can see only 9.31 microsecond has been taken so this is marginally faster because right now the python interpreter is not invoked during the execution of the function and this function has been compiled into a binary and stored in cache so this execution of this function is much more faster now we just saw that the mixed data type is a huge issue what if we do output equals to an empty list and instead of indexing over output which we cannot do because it is empty right now we can actually do append so output dot append then we will append 0 and similarly we can do output dot append then we can append 1 now if we run this we did exactly the same thing but this timing is in milliseconds while previously we got in microseconds so right now we are much more slower than before so this append method or this list data type is not actually directly supported so when we want to compile a jtet function working with arrays will be much more faster than working with lists because lists are a python exclusive thing and although we are doing no python equals to true a representation of list has to be created inside these functions because list can hold multiple type of data types but whereas the typical implementation of arrays will be of only one kind of data type so every time while appending anything it needs to resolve the data type of the entry that we are inserting in the list even though we are not passing mixed values it still needs to identify the data type of the value we are passing in that's why this method is also slow so numpy.array will be the best choice to go forward with if we want to accelerate our functions which can run on the CPU also and the same concept of not using a list also applies in the CUDA.jit decorator so moving on to the next thing we have imported something called vectorize so let's use that so after the vectorize operator my code logic is same so if the number is even we'll go with 0 and if the number is odd we'll go with 1 but over here we are not looping over some for loop we have only written the code logic now this has a special property because of vectorize because it can take a single number so we can do something like func vectorize then we can pass in 3 and if we run this we can see that the output has been returned 1 
So if we pass 2, which is an even number, output will be 0. But then again, we can also pass an array. And it will be run over the entire array. So no need to use loops. Let's do the time it. Now, as you can see, although the vectorize can work on the single number or an array, the vectorize takes a little bit longer because it still has to decide whether the data type passed in is a single number or an array and then it will create the appropriate functionality to deal with the single number or to deal with an array. After that, the execution will happen. So using vectorize can be very flexible when you have different kind of data shapes but if your data shape is defined, going with a JTAG function with proper structure is always faster. And that's it. I hope the acceleration basics tutorial series based off of number and CUDA was helpful to you. Also, feel free to let me know how this tutorial series helped you accelerate your applications. Thank you for watching this video. Thumbs if you liked it. Do share it with your friends and family. And make sure to subscribe for more content and let me know in the comment section below.